Good afternoon, everyone watching. Good afternoon, everyone watching online here in the Philippines and abroad. Welcome to the Development Academy of the Philippines Public Sector Productivity Webinars. So my name is Gerard Calambro, and I will be your moderator. Let me introduce our co-moderator, Mr. Michael Angelo Sarabia. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, Gerard, and everyone watching online. So we would like to give a shout out to the following agencies watching right now. We have the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, the Quezon City Police District. We also have the Commission on Higher Education watching us, the Department of Energy, the Philippine Ports Authority, the Department of Health. We also have the Department of Trade and Industry. We also have uh, participants from Mindanao, the Department of Education from Dinagat Islands. We also have the Cooperative Development Authority, the students and teachers from University of the Philippines, Los Baños, the Commission on Higher Education, the Commission on Elections. We also have the Mariano Marcos State University 
and the National Mapping and Resource Information Agency. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Engineer Rene, and I would like to welcome you to this introductory course on root cause analysis. I will be showing you basic tools which will be very helpful and practical in solving repetitive problems in the office or in the factory. But first, let me ask you this question. How many times have you expected the report, but that report came a bit too late? Or it was full of errors and mistakes? Or how about when you're in the factory and you encounter repetitive problems because the operator did not follow instruction, did not follow the step-by-step -step procedure, or intentionally skipped some steps, did some shortcuts in order to achieve the production target for the day. The usual knee-jerk reaction is to blame the poor administrative clerk or the production worker. But think about this. Are they really the persons to blame? Can they be blamed for doing, for trying to do a good job? Or is the problem systemic? Okay, so let us proceed with the course. The course content, I will be talking about the objectives and then the definition. What is root cause analysis? What are the benefits of root cause analysis? And then I will talk you through the problem solving process, the systematic problem solving process. And I will also be showing you the root cause analysis techniques and some examples. Upon completion of this course, you are expected to understand the importance of a root cause analysis. Also, to identify the root cause of a problem using the systematic problem solving process. And finally, to understand the application of basic quality tools in problem solving process. Let's go to definitions first. What is a root cause? A root cause is the factor that leads to the cause and effect. It sets into motion a cause and effect that leads to an identified problem. When this identified problem is eliminated, it prevents the recurrence of a problem in the same line or maybe in the other line, in the same line but different teams, or in the same line with different machines, or, you know, a combination of these uh, possible scenarios for recurrence of a problem. That is why whenever there is a problem, recurring problem that happens in the workplace, it is very important that we have to zero in on the root cause of the problem. So what is root cause analysis? Root cause analysis is part of the complete problem solving process. The step is number one, you have to identify the problem. Where did it happen? When did it happen? What machines were involved? What was the shift when the problem occurred? What were the type of materials? What, were, what was the batch of the materials? What were the environmental conditions when that problem occurred? Next is contain and, and analyze the problem. The third is finding the root cause of the problem by employing the basic techniques of root cause analysis, which we will discuss later on. You know, there are three basic types of, of uh, causes. These are the physical cause, the human cause, and the organizational cause. So after identifying the root cause, next step is to recommend and implement corrective actions. And the last and final steps is validation. Validate the effectiveness of the corrective actions that you have implemented. So what are the situations when you can use root cause analysis? Several, several situations. Number one, when there is an, an unexpected risk event. There was an earthquake and suddenly you do not have a steam supply, you do not have compressed air supply, you do not have power, or 
when there is a process or product failure. Your lines don't work anymore as, as, uh, as you expected them to work. Or when there is a, a damage or a loss to your product or to your property. Next is, this one is frequent when you have frequent production stoppages. Your efficiency is already very low. Your throughput is uh, below your target. You can also use root cause analysis there. Another one is on whenever you encounter safety incidents, several accidents. These accidents may not be catastrophic accidents, but a frequent incidents of sleeping, stripping, slip strips and falls, or cuts, or you know minor abrasions, or even uh, environmental incidents. You the um, the plant has uh, accidentally discharged of standard effluent into the river systems or even health incidents suddenly you have a lot of cases of allergy uh, allergic pharyngitis skin allergy allergic rhinitis so you can use root cause analysis there also when there is quality degradation the product that you produce is off spec it doesn't conform to the standard specifications that you have in your bill of materials or there is a foreign body in your in your product or you always get um, net weight is uh, is always off which is actually very very critical that when you declare a product it has to be within a certain tolerance of net weight and finally when there is a customer complaint we always do things we produce things we want our customers to be satisfied to be happy we want to meet their requirements if, if their requirements are not met it results in 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 customer complaints of course we do not want that because that will be bad for our business so how does the problem solving process differ from our usual approach the usual approach is whenever we encounter a problem, we do firefighting. For example, when there is a request for a permit and then somewhere, somehow, in the processing of the papers, the paper got lost. So the action taken was, was to contact the requester, apologize, and then ask the requester to reapply until the requester got the permit and then Two months later, another requester came in asking for another permit and then the paper was again lost. So contact that and the other requester again, apologize, ask the requester to reapply. So the same thing has happened again and again, always firefighting. What we want to happen now, the preferred approach, is that when there is a problem, we identify the problem, you will still have to do that. Maybe do an immediate containment action. That containment action could be, again, asking the requester to reapply. Or maybe we have a photocopy, scan copy. We recreate the scan copy with a, recreating it to a new form. But after that, let us now do a root cause analysis. You go through that process of why that problem happened in the first place. What were the causes of this problem? What are the root causes? So after we have identified the root cause, we implement solutions, we monitor, we validate the solutions, the actions, the corrective actions that we have implemented. And if these actions are effective, deploy across the company or across the function across the department so the first step in problem solving process is to identify and understand the problem we have to define what is the problem when did it happen how often does it happen where did it happen what were the conditions when that problem happened because we say that a problem well defined is a problem half solved. You know that is a saying from John Dewey. So in order to have a good definition of the problem, let me tell you the parts 
of our properly written problem. First, you have to state the findings. It is a clear statement of the problem. What the problem is, when did it occur, where did it occur, and what is the impact of the problem to your goals. Next, state the objective evidences. The supporting facts of the problem, these are facts gathered through your observations, through your interviews, through the records that you have gathered, as well as through the inspections that the people have made. And finally, the requirement. What are the needs and expectations of the customer, be it stated or implied? Or it could be uh, an internal requirement, maybe a specification sheet. Or it could be a regulatory or statutory requirement. Analysis is the next step after the problem definition. Keep in mind that you have to brainstorm for possible causes of the problem. Show the relationship among the causes. Validate these causes. And then identify the root cause and classify them according to controllability. After doing that, select now the major causes that are controllable at your end. So after identifying the causes of a problem, you have to validate this cause in order for you to identify the root cause as well as classify the controllability of these causes. How do you identify the root cause from, from the several causes, possible causes that you have identified? How do you pinpoint now the root cause? There are tools available. And you can see on the board or the, on the slide, the root cause analysis techniques. There are several tools from simple to complex, from Ishikawa, diagram, the five whys, you can do brainstorming, you can do Pareto analysis, tree diagram, FMEA, as well as other tools. These are the affinity diagram, DMAKE, Kepner Trigo is and is not analysis. There are several of them. The first one and the most common and also very simple is the Ishikawa diagram, named after Kaoru Ishikawa of Japan, who was born in 1915 and uh, died fairly recently in 1989. He was an engineer, a professor at uh, Tokyo University in the um, uh, College of Engineering. Kaoru Ishikawa pioneered the quality circles in Japan. Which, which spread worldwide and is still being deployed and used until now. So we will uh, discuss each of these tools and uh, I'll give you some examples for them in the succeeding slides. So again, as mentioned, the first two of these uh, root cause analysis technique are the Ishikawa diagram and the five whys. You can use these two tools separately, but in my experience, these two tools, the Ishikawa diagram and the five whys, are usually combined. These tools are combined to find the root cause of a given problem. So, uh, Ishikawa diagram. In Ishikawa diagram, you identify the causes and you classify them. The most common method for classification of the causes are the man, method, machine, materials, and the environment. So in this Ishikawa diagram, you see the cause and effect among the different variables. And, you cut, and usually, by identifying all the causes and you see the cause and effect among these different variables, you gain insights already into the problems. So as uh, probably some of you have already used these techniques, the 5Y, it is a method of questioning to determine the causes of a particular problem. 
when you use the five why technique, you do not have to stop on the fifth why. Sometimes on the you stop on the sixth or seventh or eighth or sometimes on the third why you are already uh, able to identify the root cause of that problem. So in this slide, you can see the Ishikawa and the cause and effect diagram or sometimes called the fishbone diagram. So it is a schematic diagram as you can see here in this uh, slide. It shows you the relationship between the problem and its causes as well as the classification of causes, of causes as I mentioned before. The most common classification is the 4M and 1E. And 1 but I'll tell you later on that there are actually different classifications. You can use your own classification depending on the problem that you are trying to analyze. So here are the categories of causes. Manpower arising from actions or performance of a person. Method these are causes arising from systems or procedures or work instructions, policy, policy directives of your company. Material causes arising from items that are needed to produce a product or deliver a service. Machine, these are causes related to the use of tools, equipments, and the machineries in the workplace. And finally, the environment. These are the conditions under which a certain product or a service is being made. This slide shows you examples of a probable cause that led to the problem. So a problem is the effect or the end result of a cause, while a cause is a factor which contributes to the occurrence of a problem. Example. Low machine capacity utilization. Why? Because of an even distribution of workload. More people were assigned, let's say, to the filling machine when in fact the bottleneck operation is on the wrap around machine, which caused imbalance uh, in the workload and um, not using the capacity, the line capacity to its fullest. Another example. High rework rate. Why? Machine parameters were not defined. There was no specification sheet. So each worker has his own settings depending on, the ex on his experience. So it led to different settings which led to high rework rate. Now in this particular example, high rework rate now becomes the cause of another problem so it increasing the work rate or high rework rate led to the problem of increasing cost of operations you see the problem can become the cause that can lead to another problem so these are interrelated there is an interrelationship of the cause and the effect next example delays in online processing of requests why because of intermittent internet connection, or high accident rate, or absenteeism rate. Why? Because of poor working conditions, slippery floor, leaking roof, protruding nails, protruding materials, use of sharp objects, use of machines, perhaps that emits uh, particulate matter that fills up the, the air. So, a lot, one problem can be caused by several factors. So how do we prepare a cause and effect diagram or the Ishikawa diagram? Step one is to write down on the rightmost part of the fish or the diagram, the problem or the effect connected to a spine, uh, as you can see in this diagram. On the next slide, step number two is identify major causes or groups of causes. Write them in the large bones. So in this particular case, the categories or the major causes are the most common one. Man, machine, material, method, and the environment. Depending on the problem, 
that you are solving or depending whether you are producing a product or if you are a service company, you could use a diff different cate category for the cause and effect diagram. Usually for service companies, they use the people, provisions, procedures, place, and patrons or customers. They use the five Ps as a major category of the fishbone. So here, in this example, we are using the four Ms and one E, man, machine, material, method, and environment. The third step is to identify the causes under each major cause or group of causes by asking why five times and write each cause into the middle or the small bones. So this is an example actually of using two techniques in a problem solving case. In this example, we use the Ishikawa diagram combined with the five whys. So you can actually use a couple of other tools to get to the root cause of a problem. Finally, the last step for drawing a cause and effect diagram is to determine whether a cause is controllable or uncontrollable. So what you can do is just to encircle the cause that is controllable on the part of the process owner. In this slide, the controllable causes are highlighted. So here's a cause and effect example. The problem is delayed election report, for example. So under the category for machine, why was there a delay in election report? Because of slow vote count. Now, why was there a slow vote count? Because of inadequate number of counting machines. How come there is an in inadequate number of counting machines? Because of equipment breakdown. And why is there an equipment breakdown? Because they are overused, overheating. And another possible cause is the machine parts not available. The roller parts are not available. The paper guide for the vote counting, counting machine is not available. So that's an example of a cause and effect diagram. And you drill down the causes by using the five whys. So what are the steps in identifying the root cause? Number one, you have to classify whether the cause is controllable or not by, uh, by the process owner or the function owner. Next is use brainstorming technique to verify a cause through logic. It's a logical proof. Or you can do reality verification. How? By observation, going to the line, observe the line, or interviewing the people doing the jobs. Also reviewing past records and results verification. You do testing, checking, experimenting, simulation, or taking actions, and then evaluate the results of this action. Next, write the results of the actions taken in verifying the cause. And finally, make a remark whether it is the most probable cause or not. The 5Y technique. This is a simple question asking method in order to drill down to the root cause of a problem. In here, the root cause can become obvious on the third or even fourth why. But sometimes you couldn't figure out the root cause even at the fifth why, so you extend maybe to the sixth or seventh why. And the root cause should be described at the system level, not on a person level. Remember the saying that people do not fail processes or systems do. And then, corrective actions should address or eliminate the root cause of the problem. And then, verification should ensure that the system is robust. And if the system is robust, the problem is not likely to reoccur. And finally, the implementation of your corrective actions should be supported by objective evidence. Take note, that in the previous slide, we said that indicators of a root cause is when you have already agreed through your brainstorming process. The cause that you have identified is logical. It makes sense. And the cause is something that is um, within the control or within the influence of the process owner where the problem occurred. So here is an example of a 5Y technique written in a fishbone diagram style. 
Problem, slippery or unsafe floor. Why? Because there's oil on the floor. Why? Because the machine is leaking. Why is the machine leaking? The oil coupling of the machine is leaking. Why is the oil coupling leaking? Because the rubber lining inside the oil coupling is already worn out. Why is the rubber lining worn out? Finally, the stock of rubber lining ran out. There is no more store stock, so they were not able to replace the rubber lining. That caused eventually slippery or unsafe floor. Another example, frequent delays in the submission of reports. Why? Because of frequent computer breakdown. So what then? Why do you frequently encounter computer breakdown? Because there is no regular system check and maintenance of the computer. Why? Because the IT section is severely undermanned. Why is that section severely undermanned? Because of high personal turnover. A lot of people are resigning from that department. Why? Because the salary structure is not competitive. So, in the next slide, here is an example of a 5 why that is written in various uh, rec rectangles going to the right. So, you have uh, several ways of representing your 5 whys. In this example, you have a problem of flat tire. Why? Because there are nails on the garage floor. Why? Because the box on the nails on the shelf split open. Why? Because the box got wet. Why? Because the rain through the hole in the garage roof caused the box to get wet. Why? Because the roof shingles are missing. Finally, in this next slide, is another graphical way of illustrating your root cause analysis through 5Y technique. In this example, the problem is the conveyor belt. It stopped. Why has the conveyor belt stopped? Because the main pulley for the rotating belt is not functioning. And why did it not function? Because it is not getting enough power from the motor. How come there is no enough power from the motor? Because the motor has stopped working. So why then did the motor stop working? Because the electrical windings for the motor got burned. Why? Because the motor was overloaded beyond its capacity. Why? Because there were no instructions about the maximum load weight for the motor. So it turned out that people were loading the motor beyond its capacity. That was the reason why the conveyor belt stopped. So in this example, it took us six whys in order to get to the root cause of a problem. You see, you have finally deciphered that the load on the motor was more than its uh, bearing capacity. So you either need to replace the motor with a more powerful one or restrict the maximum load weight for the motor. On the next slide, it shows you that you have to be cautious in uh, using the 5Y technique. In this particular example, it doesn't drill down to the system level for the root cause. It ends up with the personal attribute or decision of a person. It doesn't end up in the conditions that allowed the person to arrive at a certain decision. So it ended up in a personal level, not on the system level. So the root cause there is the employee, the driver, decided to accompany the boss to a drinking session. So it, it, it's human error. And then it ended there. That is actually not the... A true root cause of the problem. You know, the true root cause should end up in the system vulnerabilities of an organization. What were the conditions that allowed the person to make such a decision? So, again, it has to end up at the system level. It doesn't end, end up with human error. Okay, so this is just a caution for everybody, for anybody who will use the 5Y technique. The next slide 
we'll show you a problem of a bus that fell off the elevated highway. And then the root cause is that it was raining at the time of the incident. Is that the true root, root cause? So remember, the root cause, when, if we have to identify the root cause, it has to be controllable. So we shouldn't pinpoint a root cause that is force majeure or that is beyond the control of, of uh, the persons. So these are the things that you have to keep in mind when you use the 5Y technique. So the next uh, tool or technique is brainstorming. This is something that is familiar to us all and I also like this technique because it creates a feeling of camaraderie among the team members. There's a feeling of belongingness. So it is actually a group process technique for getting a lot of ideas in a short period of time. So the method, the leader writes down the, the, the problem statement and then each participant generates ideas about the causes of the problem. The session leader writes them down in full view of the others. And once these ideas are already laid down on the table, they start voting for the most popular idea. You can do this both two ways. Either round robin, so after one member of the group gives his idea about the cause of a problem, it goes on with the next member of the team and the next and so forth and so on. Another technique for brainstorming is um, fast ideation, wherein the members of the team write down their ideas, the, the causes for a problem in a note or sticky pads as much as possible, and then they post it on the wall. So either of these techniques are, are okay. There are basic rules for brainstorming. Number one is no criticism because if you at the brainstorming stage and you criticize or you shoot down the idea already, you stifle the initiative of that member which we don't want because we want everybody to participate without necessarily judging on the idea set forth by the member. Next, encourage wild ideas, you know. No idea is so too wild. All ideas are acceptable. Next, strive for creativity and volume. The more ideas, the better. And then hitchhike on the idea of one. It not only builds up the morale of the one who set forth the idea, but it creates better and better ideas from uh, an idea which doesn't seem feasible at first when you see the suggestion. But if you build on it, it gets more and more feasible and acceptable. So it is very important to hitchhike and uh, great ideas are generated from hitchhiking with uh, earlier ideas already generated. And incubate, you know. Take time to reflect on all the ideas listed. You do not have to rush, you know. You can be given three minutes. Give your team three minutes. Okay, you think about these ideas. And then if you have some more ideas, you give it to the group. And use these ideas as is. No editing, no interpretation, no evaluation, no judgment by the leader. Next tool that we can use is the tree diagram. This tree diagram is also called a schematic diagram, tree analysis, or analytical tree, and hierarchy diagram. This tree diagram is used to break down broad categories into finer and finer levels of detail. From, you know, it helps you move from vague or generalities to specifics, whether it's action plan or, or root cause analysis. You can use this tree diagram for pinpointing the true root cause of a problem. And you can also use this tree diagram when you have already pinpointed the true root cause and you are in the process of suggesting or looking for corrective actions already. I will show you an example of that one in the succeeding slides. So when do you use a tree diagram? Number one, when you already know an issue and then you have to move from generalities 
to specifics and to finer levels of detail. Number two, and this is where uh, I will be giving you an example, is when you already have the root cause of the problem and you are in the process of developing actions to carry out solutions or other plans. Next is when you analyze processes in detail and when probing for the, again, as I mentioned, when you can also use this for to arrive at the root cause of a problem. You can use tree diagram when evaluating implementation issues for several potential solutions. And of course, as a communication tool to explain details to others. So a tree diagram has actually several uses. Here, how do you make now a tree diagram? So if you use a tree diagram, for implementation of corrective action, what you do is you write down the basic objective on the left-hand side of the diagram and then make second measures and you deploy, ask why, and then make the third measures deploy. Continue with the deployment of the measures until you reach very specific and concrete action plans. And then at the end of the exercise you confirm the relationship between your target or your objective as well as the specific measures at the right hand side of the tree diagram and after that of course you write the name of the objective the limitations your the members of the group the date and the place of the meeting so in here this is an example i mentioned as when you have an objective and you want to go into clearer and clearer or finer details of implementing action plans. In this particular case, to reduce the rate of back jobs by 50% by the end of the month. So, you want to increase the competencies of service personnel. The first measures would be to provide additional technical training and increase personal awareness on back job rate. Next, for you to provide additional technical training, you send this personnel into se semi-annual seminars and workshops, or you conduct regular performance debriefings, and then drill it down further for you to be able to send personnel into semi-annual workshop you get the support from top management, get the funds from them for you to conduct regular performance debriefing, schedule quarterly meeting for service personnel, document countermeasures, and so forth and so on. So that is an example of a tree diagram that you can use in your root cause analysis process. So those are the tools and the techniques that you can use for your problem solving processes in the workplace. But I would like to give you just a few reminders on finding the root cause of a problem. So finding the root cause should use a disciplined approach. Use the technique. Do the systematic analysis. Don't skip a necessary step. And it is also important that you have to address the system problem. Do not stop at the human error. I will explain later on. Root cause process should be a team effort. It has to be verified. And again, as I mentioned, do not stop at uh, staff or human error. It is critical that no blame environment is uh, established when you are doing a root cause analysis. Because most of the human errors are due to process errors in the first place. A sufficiently robust process that you have put in place in your workplace effectively eliminates human errors. You know, placing blame on the person doesn't correct a root cause situation. So you ask yourself, is the training that the person received adequate? Is there documentation? Is the documentation available? Is documentation correct, clear, and updated? Are the right skill sets present? Your root cause analysis is only as good 
as the information that you collect. So always remember that. You have to understand what happened. You have to define the problem well before you can understand why it happened. And again, I would like to repeat that you have to validate and analyze the root cause. You do data analysis, reality verification, you observe, you interview, you go to the workplace. You gather records and data and reanalyze them. You also do results, verification, you check, you test, you experiment, you simulate, and show relationship among the causes. When you do a cause and effect diagram, it is important that you classify them and identify them according to controllability. It has to be within the, the root cause has to be within the control of the process or the function owner. And then, of course, select the major root causes. There could be several uh, root causes for a given problem. Just select the major. Use that Pareto principle. And once you have identified the root causes of your problem, it is now time for you to suggest solutions. Recommend corrective actions to management and implement these corrective actions. But before you recommend these actions, make sure that these actions are feasible. Is it within budget? Is it within the available resources in terms of time, materials that may be needed, etc.? Next is appropriate. Solutions should be commensurate to the extent of the problem and effect. Next, as much as possible, involve the employee in the corrective action implementation. Involve the department, the manager, from the manager to the shop floor personnel. There has to be a buy-in of the process owners. And finally, focus on the system. Uh, I have I kept on repeating this one that you don't stop at blaming a person but look for the weaknesses of the system. Implement solutions that can prevent uh, human errors. Next is to implement and monitor the corrective actions. It should be based on the action plan. Uh, there has to be a concurrence of management as well as the process owner with the necessary resources and on do it on agreed timelines. Finally, you have to verify the effectiveness of your action plans. Monitor and measure the process to verify the effectiveness of the actions taken. Remember, what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. So always, that you have to rely on data, you have to measure things. Poor results often indicate wrong root cause or wrong corrective actions. Consider also performing audits, regular audits, as part of our verification tools. Although for those of you who are ISO 9001 certified, uh, that is part of the system when you conduct regular audits on a semi-annual, quarterly, or, or an annual basis. So with that, we have completed the basic or introductory course on root cause analysis. I do hope that you employ these techniques in your workplace, involve your shop floor personnel. The more people who are knowledgeable on root cause analysis, the better for your company. It will be send them to trainings. By sending your people to trainings, that will be a minimal investment for your most important resource, the people. So with that, thank you very much for your time. And I will entertain questions from your end. Thank you. Uh, I guess we can now proceed to the first set of questions that we have noted, even when Sir Rene is giving his lecture. All right, so let's start with Christy May Magno. The question is, what is the specific timeline for validation? Is there any standard which identifies the timeline for an effective root cause analysis? Sir? Actually, there is no specified timeline. But when you get into a, a problem-solving analysis, when you go into a project, 
usually you have already set forth a timeline or a gun chart you follow this timeline based on of course on your priorities on your objectives on how important this particular problem or objective is but in terms of validation what you do is after every root cause identified by brainstorming of a group so preference when you do root cause analysis you do it with a group and involve those who are working in the line, those who are actually doing the work. So what you can do is while doing the root cause analysis, you already start gathering data. You already start gathering records so that you can do things simultaneously, pinpointing the causes and at the same time, looking at the records and looking at the data. And uh, maybe if you have time, you go to the line, you check, you observe the problem itself. So there is no specific timeline. The timeline would depend on how urgent the problem is, how you define the whether how risky that particular project is, and depending on your OPCR or your department's objectives. Next question by Rika B. Alvis. So she was asking about uh, in doing the five whys, who should be answering the whys? It depends. Uh, if you are doing the project alone, so you should be answering the five whys. But normally, when you are doing a root cause analysis, it is by a group, it is by a team. It's it's the you do it by brainstorming. You know, I I specifically love brainstorming because you interact with a lot of people, you discuss, you build camaraderie, teamwork. It's fun, and then everybody will uh, give ideas. There's a saying that two heads are better than one. So better if everybody in your team gives ideas or answers to the five whys and also make sure that the composition of the team will involve the supervisors perhaps the managers and those specifically people doing the job because they know more of the problem than than anybody else parang asawa na nila yung linya na yon when i was working with a with a company in a manufacturing plant tawag namin dun sa mga operator oh yung asawa mo because they spend most a lot of their time with their machines than their spouses sometimes. So get a team and uh, let everybody share their ideas. Brainstorming. Everybody should be involved in identifying the root causes of the problem. So there's a question here mm. from Bea Asuncion. Why maintenance guideline for equipment are necessary? Yes, very true. Take a look at yung Discovery Channel, yung Seconds to Disaster. Have you watched that? So, bakit importante yung, yung maintenance guidelines? Because sometimes, a failure of an equipment is because of a wrong part number, wrong screw, wrong nut, wrong bolt, or maybe the same type of part but a different part number. So, importante yung they have specifications, they have procedures, they have maintenance guidelines, especially if these equipments are critical equipment, especially for airplanes. I agree, no, Good sir. Uh, yung um, maintenance guidelines is not just applicable for equipments, but also to the human aspect, to the organizational uh, structure, for example. It's very interesting. These concepts is uh, applicable on different spectrum of life. Like yeah. so car maintenance, there's also uh, we are mm. also following preventive maintenance, and also with the heavier equipment at industrial levels. This right. version, naman, yung root cause would be really reflective. Dun sa ano nga ginagawang maintenance, we really try to flesh out problem so it's very interesting yung relation nilang dalawa na. yeah right correct All right. so going back as well to brainstorming you have a question with miss Gemma. she is asking with the current situation of uh, work from home setup what tool can we use maybe online that you can recommend for the team to brainstorm for root cause analysis even though we are apart or we are working from home sir so what uh, oh. online tool do you recommend sir I yeah, think sure. Thank you very much for your question, Gemma. For for a lot of you, this this is a first time experience. You know, the last time we had the pandemic was was when uh, 1918, 100 years ago, and then ngayon lang. So this comes once in a lifetime. So ngayon lang nangyari yun, work from home. Initially, we thought ah, sarap ng work from home, pero eventually nakakapagod pala kasi because of daming distractions, and daming obstructions, masakit sa mata, nakaupo ka lang. Sometimes our chair are not ergonomic. But yung brainstorming. Ako, I, I, I am, my, my preference is actually Google Meet. So it's better to Google Meet because when, when you meet online, pwede mo kasi ma-record dyan. 
and then you can review what you have discussed. You can take down notes. I have a preference for Google Meet, maybe because I, and then you have a lot of tools like yung Google Drive. You can save your files in the Google Drive for free up to 15 gigabytes, di ba? You can access it even online or offline. For those of you who are applying for the Philippine Quality Awards, you know, some of the, I am one of the assessors. We do make the assessment mm, online sometimes, their application to make sure na confidential yung all the information. They don't give us a hard copy anymore. We read it online. But when you discuss, better if you do it. Of course, you can also do itong, this particular uh, mode, which is webinar jam. You can also do Zoom. But my personal preference is Google because there are a lot of tools for Google also. You have Google Meet, uh, you have this uh, Google Calendar, you have the Google Drive. Uh, I wanted to share then from the point of the academy since yeah, we might. do a lot of workshops, yeah. we do a lot of another meetings, um, government uh, organization din kami who try to brainstorm different ideas on how we would better serve, how we would do better webinars for example. Um, and so workshops namin, we sometimes use this application na website, it's called Mural, M-U-R-A-L. Oh. A mural. In this application kasi, di ba, in team meetings and brainstorming, parang yung medium natin ito kapag physical would be whiteboard and we would jot down ideas. We would throw different um, opinions, which is kapag Google Meets lang, parang mahirap. So through mural, we are able to have a digital whiteboard to navigate different notes, sticky notes, and different tools para mas makapag-communicate better. And also, uh, sa Google, uh, na mention nga ni Sir Rene kanina yung Google Meets and also Google Sketchboard. So it's also same with Mural. Yeah. Pwede mong gamitin yung Google account mo to access the features ng Sketchboard. Bali, parang may sticky notes din siya. Parang you can connect arrows. Kasi ba when we go online, we would be able to iterate yung pagturo-turo. It's hard, ba Kasi we're just facing the webcam. Dun sa Mural or sa Sketchboard, may tools na arrow my tools na mapag, mapaglilink natin yung mga inputs natin. So that would be ano, uh, some of the uh, um, tips siguro that, we can, that uh, here in the academy we, we also use. Oh, take it from Mike. Teki na teki ito. Uh, millennial kasi. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Very good. All right. So Mike, can we have another question? There's another question here. I think a lot of participants is, I know, parang ito yung one of their biggest concerns. So, oh. from Gemma no. Eileen. The more interaction, the better. Is it, and also, similar dun sa sinabi ni Juanita Padua, there are times that it could not be avoided that the root cause eventually ends up with the head of the agency being <laughs> the root cause of the problem. Is it not be considered a system level evaluation? Because after all, all systems have people as a vital component. You have to take note, why are we doing problem solving? We do problem solving in order to solve the problem. We have to look at the root causes. Sometimes, even if it is due to the head of the department, but you have to look at underlying causes. Why does the head of the department act that way? Maybe because the head of the department wasn't competent enough. Maybe the head of the department doesn't know what the depart or the OPCR or the mission of the objective. Maybe the head of the department is new, or maybe there was there needs to be further action on the competencies and the capabilities of the head of the department, or maybe the head of the department will need more trainings on human interactions, on being a leader. So you know, my point is human actions usually, especially in a workplace, that is actually affected by a lot of systems we are doing like for example strategic planning system so we do things according to, to the system of course we run the system but there are also systems that can prevent or correct actions of some person including your department heads it may come from the competency of the person it may come from the lack of skills maybe what you need is to increase the leadership capability or the people handling skills of the department heads but then again i would like to caution everyone on pinpointing a person you have to have at least data or records how many times did the person make that data and what were the conditions when when that particular decision was made 
if that person decided to let's say to run the line despite this and this what were the conditions of that line what were what was the humidity what is the temperature what were the other parameters that made that decision run that lines so again we have to base it on data on records on figures as well as the conditions including the training so take a look still even if you you strongly feel that it is because of your department head make sure that you have validated that record you have analyzed it you have figures as much as possible bias across the figures because i am an engineer yes. okay sir so another one related to biases is from rose la girl with mr paolo serrano the question is these methods may sometimes do flawed because of personal biases or inclinations any mm-hmm. tips to how to remain objective while making or trying to locate the cause of the problem so that is the main problem with research or with conducting these tools is mm. the human bias because you're yes. inclined to believe that so how do we also prevent that from happening sir my personal experience i used to handle the quality development tool in my previous company and then we had quality circles that competed nationally they won in the national awards my personal bias if i am there i go to the line where that problem occurred. It's human nature that sometimes we tend to be subjective. Sometimes when, when somebody tells us this, we tend to believe. But you verify by going to that line. Get the data, get the records. There is a listing of the validation of the observations of the figures there. Study that. Sometimes you may even have to input them individually in, in a laptop and then analyze. Use your team, the whole team, to analyze these figures. Because you know it prevents personal biases sometimes when you are biased against a certain thing it's better to have two or three people who analyze the problem and then involve also the people doing the job itself but my go to approach is to gather data go to the line gather data just to make sure because data figures don't lie if you have the figures sometimes even if you have to make presentations to your bosses you just show them the figures the trends the graphs and you don't even have to say a word they will make the same conclusion that you have in your mind thank sure, you for that very question. very well said sir so mike you have la- the last two questions please yeah last question it's past three a question from dina sarne from doh bl hello HSD. dina doh department uh, so of health asking about, uh, how will we know if the root cause we identified is the correct root cause mm. i think it's related to the earlier question like how they discounted the person to be the root cause but just like what you've said yeah. there could be many things so how do we identify if it is really the one that they needed to address yeah. dina first of all i would like to thank you for being the frontliner in this fight against covid-19 during the uh, the pandemic you still took time to attend this root cause analysis thank you for attending and uh, may your tribe increase you identify the root cause by reaching at the consensus of your brainstorming of your group usually you get your group reach for a consensus if that is the root cause or not and then validate that further maybe you have to do simulation maybe you have to do some experiments maybe you have to dig past uh, historical records but then again the final arbiter would be a consensus of the group of your team all right sir so um last two questions so i'll combine the question of emmanuel yeah. malu so is there a reference standard for root cause analysis so this is uh, related to i think the iso and another one is who is supposed to be doing the verification and closure of the nonconformities Ah, oh, oh so okay. Yeah, that's yeah. the, so the question. I think the one who asked the question is a member of the organization and that organization is ISO 9001 certified. Yes, sir. Most so thank you for being certified for ISO 9000 during the internal audit or management review or third party audit, you encounter nonconformities. And when you encounter nonconformities, you have to look at the root cause of the problem. Normally, uh-huh. there's somebody who raised the nonconformity, yung auditor yan, raised the nonconformity. Yes. Or any member of the organization can raise a nonconformity through RFA, request for request for action. They raise this nonconformity and then it's the process owner, the function owners will have to brainstorm what was the root cause of this nonconformity and the process owners will have to implement the actions to correct the root cause and do validation 
of the effectiveness of the actions implemented. So it's usually the auditor who raises the non-conformities, but in terms of analyzing the root cause, implementing the corrective actions and validating the corrective actions, it is the process or the function owner. So, so I believe that was a very interesting discussion this afternoon. Uh -huh. I would like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar session. The main takeaway is the keyword communication. Like how uh, Sir Rene had um, said about the trying to determine the root causes, about how do we try to find it out. It should be a consensus and it should be a teamwork and it should not be just the top management who are involved. So how would they be able to do that? So it's through pro proper communication and proper consultation with everyone in the system, everyone in the hierarchy from the very bottom of the organizational chart. It's very important to uh, have their opinion heard without communication like if it's just the top management doing the root cause analysis then it would be encompassing because as sir said nga, earlier uh, an organization will only be able to pinpoint the important details when everyone is involved the one who is really doing the everyday task so i think for me it's communication and yeah. it's been a very um productive afternoon mm -hmm. today right an Sorry. engaging afternoon yes. with everybody thank yeah. you very much so on behalf of the academy i would like to thank everyone for watching and we hope that you have learned a lot from this afternoon session so again my name is gerard calambro yep. my name is michael sarabia and my name is rene alvarado and thank you and see you again on the next session of the public sector productivity webinars thank you